Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Seeking Play. My name is Dr. Jane Hessian. I'm Ronan Healy. And just a reminder to our listeners at home that you can watch your interviews on YouTube and Spotify, as a number of our guests throughout the season built out their thoughts using Lego. In today's interview, we were joined by the incredibly talented Sonny Brown. Sonny is a social entrepreneur, best-selling author, keynote speaker, expert collaboration designer and facilitator, and earnest American Zen practitioner. She's the founder of creative consultancy, Sunny Brown Inc., and was named one of the 100 most creative people in business and one of the 10 most creative people on Twitter by Fast Company. Her TED Talk has drawn, drawn over 1.6 million views and her work on visual thinking has been featured in every US publication. Sonny's two globally beloved books, Gamestorming, a playbook for innovators, rule breakers, and change makers, and The Doodle Revolution, Unlock the Power to Think Differently, have been translated into 25 languages and counting. And she's one of the educators widely credited with the rise of visual thinking as a tool for deeper inquiry. So having rewatched Sonny's wonderful interview, Ronan and I have chosen three quotes that we think you would enjoy that we would like to share with you today. So the first quote, when you are in play, your mind is not concerned with all of the potentialities that you preoccupy yourself with. You're in a field of curiosity and possibility. And the second quote, doodling like play is a gorgeous expression of our humanity. Humanity has been doing this forever. It's timeless for contemplation, engagement, focus, and slowing down. And the final quote, without play, spiritually, we get old, emotionally, we get weary, and cognitively, our plasticity is compromised. We need to ask ourselves what we should be more afraid of. I love that quote. <laughs> um, and you know what you shouldn't be afraid of? The possibility of doing training and particularly one-to-one -one coaching with Sonny Brown and, and also the other co-founder, uh, Leah James, of the Center for Deep Self-Design. And when we were talking to Sonny, she, she mentioned um, a conundrum she was um, working on at the moment. And Sonny used the phrase softening the separation. And it's something that we've said a number of times. It just maybe it was just a throw throwaway um, piece of a sentence that Sonny said, but the softening the separation. It now makes sense when we look at the Center for Deep Self-Design, um, because it is to us a really unique offering that seems to be at the intersection of spirituality, uh, self-discovery, and curiosity. So by all means, obviously go and check out uh, the, the podcast, buy Sonny's books, go to the Center of Deep Self-Design, um, because uh, it would be a wonderful opportunity to work closer with Sonny and Leah James also. Mm -hmm. So for now, folks, we, we really, really enjoyed this conversation. We had such a fun time, and we hope you will too. I'm sure you will. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Sonny, you are very welcome to the Seeking Play podcast. We are very excited and honored to have you as a guest today. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so excited. I got distracted by my Legos. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're already on the table. Stop. Yeah. Listen to the adults. Stop. <laughs> Stop doodling. Hey, conduct yourself. <laughs> yes. Um, so Sonny, we are so excited, as I said, to have you as a guest this afternoon, and we are really, really, um, eager to talk all things play with you. So I'm going to kick things, you know, off by asking you to share with us and the listeners, what were you like as a kid? I loved that question because you know, people do change so much over time. I think people kind of underestimate how much, how different you are as a human being in the different stages of development. So when you asked me that question, I had to remember who I was then because there's certain qualities I still have, but other ones I don't have, in, or, you know, like they're not lost. They've just matured or they've dissolved or they've um, adapted. So when I was a kid, my my memory of myself is that I was very spunky. Mm -hmm. um, they used to, I had a nickname, which was Punky Brewster, which is <laughs> the character. Do y'all yeah. know who that is? Yeah. Okay. So I did have that nickname, but it wasn't considered flattering. Like it was not a positive nickname. <laughs> I liked it, but other people didn't. 
And I was um, very small, like freakishly tiny. I didn't really grow until I was like 14 or 15. So I was really small. Mm -hmm. Um, And also I was a bright, you know, but I felt like that was obligatory because my name on some Mm -hmm. level is sort of was an obligation, Mm -hmm. which I hate. So I, so I nicknamed myself Stormy so that if I wanted to have attitude, I could have that Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to Sunny. And then uh, I was very deeply curious and still am and also super playful for sure and still am and um and uh despite my tininess I was like very capable of defending myself and so because my brother taught me that Mm because I have an older brother and he was a rough bastard and so (laughs) 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 so I was not like a pushover you know which has been helpful in our line of work when you have to cajole convince Mm -hmm. or be steadfast in the face of people who don't understand what you're doing and why and they want to kind of shut it down and so forth so and mostly mostly male environments when I first was starting my career so you really that has served me well in many ways um and also I was very fearful so that's the other thing is like you know like you meet little dogs and they're like Mm -hmm. the, the most angry I was definitely underneath like scared shitless. So mm-hmm. <laughs> that's all in there, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so from that, you know, lovely rich experience or description of your, of your childhood, is there any bumps, bruises, scrapes, breaks, or just little mm. crazy adventures that you had as a kid that you think has contributed to your sense of identity as an adult? I mean, I think, and I put this on the sticky note, I think... So I always contextualize my responses. Y'all will notice that. <laughs> uh, I think that I ha- there was so much adversity in my background that it was um, conditions. It created conditions for all of the things that I deeply value about myself now. For example, like a growth mindset, mm-hmm. you know, like really rapid recovery from mistakes, like resilience. Mm-hmm. like um kind of so I it used to bother me when people say have no fear I'd be like that's not normal like that's not actually if you if I have no fear I'm probably a sociopath so you should be concerned mm-hmm. so yeah. so but so standing in the face of fear right like acting even though I'm afraid so yeah my whole life was a series of unfortunate events t- truthfully and there was great things in there too but it was really fodder for um um meeting challenges in ways that were super creative too so like Mm. creative problem solving and and frankly when I see kids growing up with everything taken care of and all of their needs met and their and uncertainty not part of their environments it concerns me it it bothers me Mm. um I mean part of me probably envies them (laughs) because the shit was rough but I also also think it doesn't serve them and um And so that's, ten, that tends to be where I land. And that's true. Cause you can see them in adult, like mm-hmm. when you're working with adults doing this work that we do, you can tell who is more and less capable of doing what and, and how you need to invite people differently if they don't mm-hmm. have that kind of flexibility or um, confidence, mm-hmm. you know? So it's super interesting. And so I love yeah. that question too. And I will not interview y'all, but I want to know that about you as well. Yeah, I yeah, I about think. us, but yeah, next okay, let's do a podcast where you interview us sometime. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Idea. I know, yeah, I think never, it's inevitable. Know, even, even I'm so conscious of that with um, you know, or parenting, we have a two year old and we have a seven year old, and nice. like that as well. It's 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 basically equipping them with the skills because real life isn't you know, exactly kind of daffodils and that's being right. overprotecting them, yeah we think that we're protecting them, but really yeah. we have to equip them with the resilience at such a young age. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, really, I'm, I'm really mindful of that as well. Even though it's hard for me to, you know, not be the mum and run and protect them. But well, yeah, that's the thing is it's so reasonable. Well. Mm-hmm. That's right. It's so reasonable mm-hmm. and understandable to want to yeah. protect and, and, and wrap in sort of swaddle. That's the most, that's healthy and natural mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's so fascinating is that in the, in I don't know if it's true in Ireland as well, but in America, like you used the world used to do that for you. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. So your parents weren't responsible for creating all the conditions. Like you would yeah. be running around with kids when you were five and seven on your bike, mm -hmm. like crossing creeks and like, you know, tripping yeah. and falling. And it, you didn't have to create those environments. They yeah. were just part of life. And so uh, is that true in Ireland too? Where yeah, very like much so. Unfortunately, I think, I think we've overswung in terms of parenting. And, and I, I think that's, uh, again, partly one of the reasons for us to kind of try and bring play out into the into nice. the again, um, we work with not for profits as much as we can to try and bring uh, play into the education system. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I think even globally, we lived in Australia and uh, the obesity rates are skyrocketing there too. Mm -hmm. sedentary chip kids. And you would imagine yeah. they're outdoors all the time. I do imagine. I've been there, but yeah. I, have, I didn't know that. Aspect yeah, of surprising it. to us too. And, and just one thing I would say as well about um, uh, something I read. I'm going to say it's Nietzsche. Could be wrong, okay, with all the philosophers out there. But Ooh, light Nietzsche before bedtime, you know. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Let's go, let's go with Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche, <laughs> Nietzsche. Uh, he said, uh, I think you said like the good parent fails. Mm -hmm. And I yes. went, wow, because we were on this kind of play odyssey like six, Amazing. seven years ago. And it would have kind of went over my head at the time. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I was like, oh, the context was so rich to mm -hmm. us because mm -hmm. it was like risky play is important. And yeah. another term one of my dad's friends used probably when I was in my teenage years, he said, I learned so much from the scars of poverty. Yeah. Like, Whoa, the scars of poverty. Like that's something yeah. you're going to read in a book. Mm -hmm, totally. Like that's that's where you kind of learn again, like your grit and resilience is yeah. just getting knocked down and, and getting that's back. That's the thing. It's like we have this celebration of people that are successful and that have some kind of material wealth. And it, I'm not interested in that. I don't find that particularly. I'm like, how did they acquire it? You know, like what was mm -hmm. done in order to get to that place? Material wealth's not even intriguing to me on some level, just as a spiritual sort of manifestation. But um, but the question of how people get su quote successful mm. is super relevant, you know. Like, yeah. war was it was it through a sort of arduous grappling with reality, or was it just handed to you? Because it's it's like that. I'm more impressed by people who thrive despite the odds. Mm -hmm. yeah. than I am by people who are successful when they were clearly set up to be successful. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how is that fascinating? <laughs> That's, um, when we were designing the, like, how are we going to actually, what's the structure of this, this conversation going to be? Oftentimes you, you listen to podcasts and you just want to get, you want to extract the information out of that right. this subject matter expert's head. You're like, okay, I got 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I just want to get to them. Mm -hmm. We thought we're going to go long form and we want to understand like, what were they like as a kid? Like that's yeah. the that's the most important journey that you can yeah. actually learn about. Yeah. It's not yeah. like you know Sonny Brown's book. You can go and buy it, of course, but like, right? Who is this person, mm -hmm. and how did you get to where yeah. you are? It's yeah. fascinating yeah. for us. And I think I the think viewers would love to hear that as well. They'd love to hear yeah. you know about your childhood, about your experience, yeah. and how that all helped you, you know, in your career. Yeah. And I think that like, this is a weird footnote, but so, you know, people are all in a tizzy about AI and like, what's it mm. going to do? And how you... So one of the things I read the other day, which makes complete sense to me was that the most intriguing aspect that humans will still bring to uh, life and experiences and interactions is our stories of vulnerability and recovery that mm. AI cannot generate those narratives tr in truth about itself. Mm -hmm. And so after it like eats through all of our other skill sets, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that'll be one of, the, one of the last. And and truth be told, that's what I always valued when I was trying to figure out my way through life. I always cherished those people who were completely authentic about where they were not. They didn't attempt to present themselves as if they got it all figured out. Mm -hmm. And instead they were like, oh my God, I messed it up over here. And then this is how I recovered. That's super valuable. That's what elders would have done again if society were built differently like we would have yes. that would have function would have happened in our villages and whatnot yes. but Absolutely. i mean maybe i shouldn't be in the modern era i really am not a fan you're wasted <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go back a couple of hundred years yeah i'm like as a woman i would have hated it but, I, but <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Other, <laughs> yeah so sunny can i ask you about adult playfulness and what the term would mean to you oh okay so depend in a work environment or yeah i think usually people might answer it in, in, in okay the they do okay so so there's methods that it means mm -hmm. right and y'all are you're are purveyors of those methods and um there's sort of interactions that it 
requires but internally in terms of the attributes and the qualities for me it's a, a way of being where you're comfortable with not knowing what's going to happen and you are in the sandbox like fully and completely in the sandbox and you're like purposefully turning things over and smashing things together and building things that fall and asking really probing questions you're trying to understand reality or imagine it or invent it in a way that is has some levity you know like it doesn't have to be such a somber experience and like totally analytical and cerebral like play is inclusive of all of your facets of yourself you know so your your um your brain and your heart and your gut and your hands and other people and your imagination and so I mean there's I loved all those quotes on the board it was like pick your favorite I was like oh this and then I was like oh yes oh, it's very oh, hard oh. <laughs> <laughs> there was not one I didn't love so I was like crap that's too impossible but I think it's because I think we probably share a love of play yeah. and and how valuable it is and how I mean it is priceless it is priceless mm -hmm. and how um and and it's also rare you know in our most of our environments which I think y'all run into a lot when you're in your work Yep. Is that you're kind of pioneering something that is yeah. misunderstood and underappreciated and kind of um, reduced mm -hmm. to like kindergarten in class. And oh, God, I know. I feel like I should support you in that because they're just afraid and they're just they don't y'all are pioneers. It's not easy to be that person. It's really hard to be that person. So kudos to you for real for doing we, it. We, we describe play as uh, primitive ancestral wisdom. That's mm. just been forgotten. I mean, it. it I mean, calorifically uh it's it's waste energy you're open yourself to predation you know, why would <laughs> like for thousands of years why would we want to you know create this this you know social niche and this you know this genetic uh imprint like why would risk. we want to do it so like and then but then oh, place nope nope not like so we, we'd like really to good. just you know legitimize our ancestors i think it sounds grandiose but like mm -hmm. um, oh i think you could take it there easily hmm. uh-huh I want to get to the quotes. Sorry, did I interrupt you? No. No, I interrupted you. I'm eager with the quotes <laughs> because I'm eager to tell you you broke a record. Okay. I, we had, <laughs> I don't know. We've got like what is it about eight, twelve quotes, and then we I think we said like oh, oh. pick one or two. You were like four. <laughs> I'm having four. We've had I previous uh, guest was three. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. You've also color coded them, mm -hmm. which I was very impressed. I know. With. So <laughs> what? Did, I, I'd rather. I'd like to read them in in order of importance. Oh, fantastic. So would green, purple, pink, or blue, does that mean anything to you? Or will I read the n name of the person? So oh, read the color. Green. Yak Pensep green. Nice. Alan Watts purple. I want to get the most important one to you. Ford <laughs> Bernard Shaw was in pink and Mark Beckoff was in blue. No, the code, the color coding was for, for the sheer delight of my own. <laughs> okay. There was no meaning embedded in it. Just but let's pick purple. purple. Let's start with purple. Let's go with purple. Okay, Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. oh, this is the real secret of life to be completely engaged in what you are doing in the here and now and instead of calling it work mm -hmm. realize it is play mm. y'all know who he is right alan was yeah. okay he's kind of a legend and because i am a zen student i don't know if y'all knew that about me no, but that's I, really cool, I mean, right. I've been a, yeah i've been a zen buddhist for 16 years wow. and and that so alan watts in that environment is a whole different ball of wax but um uh read it again Okay, this is the real <laughs> secret of life, to be completely engaged in what you are doing in the here and now. And mm. instead of calling it work, realize it is play. Mm. So good. Mm -hmm. So are you asking me how I feel about that quote? Yeah, you go for it. Why, why, why was it, why was why it an important think... one to mark down for you? Well, so I have to figure out what layer to, to tackle on that one, because as I was saying, he's a, a, you know, in the Buddhist canon, really. But um, uh, so I will simplify it as best I can, because seriously, right now I'm seeing a whole model of what that means <clears throat> um, in the moment. So, you know, I mean, he was a drunk, but also a Zen practitioner. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was a colorful life. Okay. And I think when you're in the moment, meaning that you're totally, your senses are, you know, kind of integrated, you're present, you're not thinking of what you're doing wrong or right. You're not wondering if you should be planning or predicting, you're not judging or criticizing, you're literally 
almost like an animal in the mm-hmm. sense of I mean my animals are my greatest teachers so many I look at them and like children too you're like oh oh thank you for the reminder because like look like the, check this out see that dude yeah oh. so cute like he's just he is not having a he's in the moment or, or yeah. right now you know <laughs> and so uh so when to me when you're in play like your um mind is unconcerned with all of the potentialities that you could preoccupy yourself with Mm -hmm. then you have just nothing but sort of it's almost into quantum probabilities like you just you're just potentiating so you're basically saying like it's just a totally wide open field of curiosity and possibility and so when alan watts says it i think of it in a zen context which is the ultimate state of not knowing Mm -hmm. um and so not layering reality with all of your knowledge and all of your labels and all of your language, but mm-hmm. like truly just being in an embodied state of curiosity and not knowing. And in that, in that state, um, um, nothing, but, but uh, it, I mean, work doesn't even make any sense, you know, like work, you're not, you don't have a goal. You're not trying to be productive. You're not trying to accomplish anything. You're just being with this incredible intimacy of life. Mm-hmm. And that is a playground, you know? Mm-hmm. And you and it doesn't have to um, be so heavy, you know. So I'm that's probably why I put purple because he's like the royal. He's like royalty. Oh, there we know? go. You Regal purple. purple. Okay, okay, I like it. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna pick Yak Pansep because you nobody's picked Yak no. before. And, and oh, again, really? No. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you know, Yak is here. Um, hence yeah. the name of uh, the podcast is Seeking Play as a homage to to Yak. My childhood play took me to extremes and all of them, I understand, were a fun way to test the rea- the social realities into which one is born. Surely mm. this is the most important evolutionary function of play, finding mm. out what is fun and fair or not fair on the field of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's talking about play as like a socializing sort of function. And um, his book, Archaeology of Emotion, like it's, so, it's such a massive piece of work, but... Um, what I was thinking about, oh, so his highest function of play, oh yeah, is like finding the boundaries and finding the, you know, sort of internal and external. Mm. And there was something that makes me think of, um, oh, so this is another, this is just thoughts I can have, right? Like I'm not trying to. Go for it. So I was reading this awesome book called Seven and a Half Lessons of the Brain. And it's a really short essays. Mm-hmm. And one of the things she was asserting I don't remember her name right now was um, Lisa Feldman Barrett was Uh, something about, Oh, she's so great. So um, something about predictive. So Uh, like, right. Like prediction is better than reaction in terms of surviving. And so when I contextualize his quote around play, I wonder if there is a subtext of safety, like in, in civilized and relational society around what is and is not acceptable and how you find that out because so much of it is implicit and assumed Mm -hmm. and when you're young and you know sort of exploring you're trying to find the edges and I wonder if that purpose of that partly is to belong like be able to belong and also to predict um, when you're gonna compromise your safety and your survival Mm -hmm. you know I mean, to your point, it's like play is, it, say say your thing about primitive ancestral wisdom. Is that what it was? Primit- a Paul, a primitive ancestral wisdom. I love it. It's so good. Do y'all have to say that to your clients sometimes? Like, no. <laughs> like, we, we actually go pretty light on talking about play. We're like systems thinking, you know, yeah. like, you know, results, strategy. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you just can't overload on, on, on the... Play. you really can't not well, yet they have their own perception that play isn't for the workplace play is for children so yeah you know, we have to kind of reframe it in in a way that they'll see that they can yeah not be it you're giving them permission you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's interesting that like after having gone through a series of, of of engagements with us people will contact us and say uh, we saw your one of your interviews, one of your podcasts. What other books are there? What other like? How can I understand what is play? One mm-hmm. one thing we realized, and again, it was part of the reason why we have this podcast. Kids don't learn what is play in school. Like, wouldn't you think it's like the most important thing for them to go? Hey, you know what you love doing outside? 
You know what? Oh, that you mean is? they don't make time for play in school anymore? Well, no, they, well, uh, sadly. Oh, you mean they don't teach less, them what it is? But they don't know what it is. They don't like uh-huh. learn about what is play. Right. Why do we play? Dogs play, dolphins play. Mm-hmm. Why do they do that? Like they don't it's learn that so in school. So partly we're trying to get that into the education system as well as a, at least a, a two hour conversation that teachers could wow. have with kids. That's what I'm saying. Y'all are kind of revolutionaries in your space because it's a big ask and it's so important though. And I, I admire your efforts to do it because it is, it's hugely significant and it's, it is such a missed opportunity to not honor it and, and train in it, you know, like teach people how to do it and why to do it. Cause to your point, it's like, it deepens problem solving. Mm-hmm. Like if you have to have a pragmatic utilitarian thing, okay, great. Let's do that. It doesn't, it doesn't preclude those things. That's crazy town. Mm-hmm. It just makes me nuts. You know, I'm like, Oh my God, I can't live in society. It's too stupid. <laughs> and that's what and that's what companies want like they want better collaboration they want better problem solvers they want better you know creative thinkers so it's yeah. yes by doing this you can get all of those like there's a relationship here <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting when, we, when we, we'll talk with a client and we'll say okay so you want your 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 staff to be a bit more childlike and they go what no no i said right. wait a minute curious open to <laughs> things you want them to tinker with mm-hmm. concepts, play with ideas? And they go, oh, damn it, you got me. <laughs> that's what I mean. It's a fear. They're fe- it's a fear-based response. And so yeah. that's why I don't, I never have let it stop me because I've been selling weird stuff in corporate for years. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, just totally undeterred on some level by their resistance because it feels like a challenge. And also because I know that they just don't know what they don't know. And it's not like they're bad or wrong. It's just that they're scared and they have people they need to look smart in front of. And it's my job to help them figure something out. And so it's just like you learn over time and I'm sure y'all are are um, already doing all kinds of things. So you have different ways of approaching people. But I just am like, it would be a shame if we stopped because people have those critical, fearful responses mm-hmm. like that. You can't evolve if you won't just keep going you know like okay let's all stay really small and tiny and let's sit around a boardroom and then people go give me your great ideas and then you're like i have no approaches like (laughs) Like, yeah go ahead jane agreed Uh okay we're halfway there because you were you're the record breaker here in (laughs) terms of quotations i'm gonna go with george bernard show Uh don't stop playing because we grow old we grow old Uh because we stop playing Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. They're all such good yeah. quotes. Uh, you guys, you you could write a book like short essays on each quote from y'all's perspective. <laughs> We're yeah. working on it. Yeah, good. Right. Oh, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, well, we want to just like just chuck it as a free kind of PDF when we're finished yeah. each season. And go like this is what Sonny Brown thought about this, and we're gonna yes. update them. Yeah, and send Seven it. Seven and a half world. essays on play. There's your yeah. book title right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, so getting old. Yes, exactly. So it's weird because it's also cognitively. So it's like spiritually, you get old. Emotionally, you get like weary. Hmm. And cognitively, you don't, uh, your plasticity is kind of compromised. So like on all these different levels, it's like, again, what are we doing? Why would we are, what are we afraid of? Like, I'm afraid of the opposite. Mm -hmm. If I'm afraid of anything, it would be not having space to keep growing and exploring and learning. That would be, that is terrifying Mm -hmm. for me. And I have witnessed many, many people and going back to my early life, that was my whole family's vibe was like, here's the rules and here's the sort of container and here's what you do. Like they were so not capable or skillful at um, mistake making and at learning and, and failing. And you know, and that's why I do have empathy for people that are in that space, like that kind of cognitively rigid space, Mm -hmm. but I would never um, acquiesce to that. And I would never encourage that. And I would never um, collude with it because it doesn't serve anyone, Mm -hmm. but it is so common. And you can see there's this wonderful memoir called Educated by, um, I forget her name, But she describes a very rigid family belief system in Idaho, in this state, in this country. Mm -hmm. And 
she describes how her father like actually becomes like physically uh sort of a it's almost like she uses language crippled because of his belief system like it shrunk him like physically shrunk him because there were so many things he was not quote allowed to Mm -hmm. uh include in his awareness Mm -hmm. and so it's a beautiful book about what happens when you don't make space for growth yeah and it's like Mm -hmm. you couldn't pay me to do that i mean there's clearly a biological function because it's friggin' everywhere Mm -hmm. but i don't want to be i just don't want to be part of that tribe (laughs) like like, you're in the playful camp yeah i'm in the (laughs) playful camp for sure yeah so Mark Beckoff, our final one. Mark was in blue, mm-hmm. just to let our listeners know. Mark was in a blue post-it note. Play is training for the unexpected. What did that resonate? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the piece about, I feel like that's the piece about not knowing. And because, and see, this is why people are so scared. So like when you, because you know how when you're working in corporate environments, they 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 say they want a new innovation or a new solution. But then when you put them on on paths to create uncertainty so that something could emerge they lose control and freak out you know (laughs) so which always is like oh here's the moment where they're going to have a panic because they're they don't know what's going to happen next or they have to they have to not have an answer Mm -hmm. or they have to um, invite someone else to know something they don't know Like all these things that are truly vulnerable moments are totally freaky for people and scary. And at the same time, what they're asking you for is that whether they realize they're never asking for that consciously, but that is what they're asking. If they're asking for a game facilitator in my language is game facilitator, then that's my job is to create that productive discomfort that Mm -hmm. is for their own, uh, for their own betterment you know, and for their teams and they, everybody feels closer afterward. Like, whoo, we went through the thing together. Yeah. Also a huge, wonderful byproduct of that experience. But yeah, you definitely have to be willing to have no clue what's going to pop out, yeah. you know, and then just meet that. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that's partly what we're trying to do is always design a, a moment of chaos like to to move mm-hmm. from rigidity in terms of even mm-hmm. uh, uh, rigidity of relating and even for I think you'll understand this rigidity of movement like how you yeah. move affects how you think mm-hmm. and how you totally. see people and so yeah you yeah. just kind of like yeah you just t- turn on the chaos function a little bit <laughs> for a while and then you're trying to drag it back into a more settled state of complexity we'll say mm-hmm. yeah um, so y'all are both into that that's so cool did y'all meet through the work or you both have a love for that stuff no um well we've 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 met as um as teenagers in 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 growing up we grew up together in limerick Um, yeah in limerick yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so we have known each other very 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 long time when you were kids Um, there was a cross there was a crossover in our work in australia so i'm from an education background so i would have always you know have worked in a university or you know a third level college and then I used to do some consultancy work so then Ronan was in the design space and then when we uh-huh. came back to Ireland we kind of came together with our yeah. research Husband and, and, wife and yeah business. so we would have very very similar obviously um oh. passion about, yeah. about play but we would be oh. quite different I suppose as well in our approach to yeah to work yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 it works. It well, works. that's a that's a good team, you know. Yeah. When you have distinctions like that, like a shared overlap, but also different strengths, it's such yeah. a great team. Wow, I had to know because I'm like, oh no, that's oh good. <laughs> it, it would be yeah. cool if we met like when we were young kids over Lego, and we were like, yeah. remember that time I met you when you were six <laughs> and I was four? We were playing with Lego, and then look no. at us now. That's no no we should oh we gotta be lie about that we one could change the story. <laughs> it's true in a different dimension yeah absolutely so sonny can i take you back to when you were starting out your career so when you think back to when you were just first starting out what advice would you give your younger self about either being maybe overly you know be, be about being more serious or being more playful in mm. the way that you interacted with others oh yeah um I, well it, it's a great question I remember now when I thought this about this uh that 
I felt like I did a great job in terms of balancing seriousness and play. So I don't think I'm the kind of, I can't thrive unless the creativity and the imaginative aspects are part of my work. I mean, I, I really, I have taken job, like the only job out of college that I ever had was um, at the department of insurance. So insurance, me at a bureaucracy <laughs> where you, cause I had written my thesis on at my, um, I went to public policy school to get a master's and I had written my, I, I needed money again. Like I was really not a, a, like we were pretty, I mean, I grew up in the woods, like in a really crappy environment. So I had no money. And so to get money in to, so I could move to San Francisco, which is what I wanted to do in my twenties. Um, I wrote my dissertation on um, insurance because <laughs> I was like, I don't care. I'll do whatever I have to do to get yeah. this scholarship. Okay. So I can get this money to go somewhere. So so I, <laughs> so I ended up get, after graduate school getting a job, of course, at the Texas Department of Insurance. And I was there for five days, like five full work days. And I called my parents and I was like, because I was so young still, you call your parents to like figure out what's going on. Like they ever gave me good advice uh, ever. But I call them. And I'm like, um, I can't do this, you know, and they, and they were like, we were wondering when you were going to figure that out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I, there was no way. So I, I felt horrible because they had created a job for me. Like they really had, cause I, I mean, it, I, it was, I feel, I still to this day, I'm cl and friends with them, but I did feel bad because I, I, I resigned, you know, I was like, I, yeah. there's no way, like my soul will die. Yeah. And I didn't say, I did not say that to them because people work there, but yeah. I was like, this is not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be good fit for this environment. And so five days, and then I started my own business because, uh, and I had no idea what I was doing. No idea. Mm -hmm. But I do know that I was so fortunate because the work that I was doing was already creative. So, yeah. cause I was a graphic recorder. So do y'all know what those people are? Yeah. They're like live yeah. visualization. Mm -hmm. So I had worked at the Grove in San Francisco and so I had training as a graphic recorder. And so I was like, well, I'll just sell my wares in Austin then, you know, and see, see what happens. Yeah. Um, so, because I do, I don't, I understand why people have to make really pragmatic decisions. Um, but honestly, I was willing to, I had already lived scrappily. So it, so being poor didn't scare me. Yeah. Like it yeah. scares people who have to, who are middle-class or above and they, they, in their minds, it's like a nightmare to be yeah. poor. For me, it was like really familiar. So I was like, yeah. well, what am I going to lose? I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> so that helped. Um, and so, but, but I do think like when I did the Enneagram, have y'all taken the Enneagram? No, that, never did. no, no. Oh, it's just like a personality test that people, it's kind of very robust. People are very into it. Right. And like the MBTI, you know, it's yeah. been around since the 70s. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm a type four to find, comes to find out, which is an intense creative. And so. I don't think, you know, I can sort of tell stories about why I chose whatever, but at the end of the day, I really don't think I can function without an outlet for creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. I think I would just lose my mind. Mm -hmm. So the advice that I would give myself is like, take better care of yourself though. Cause being an entrepreneur is exhausting. I'm sure y'all know. Absolutely. Um, yep. It's exhausting. So I had to learn a lot of self-care and self-stewardship. Yeah practices so definitely that I would have done better but in terms of balancing creativity and um what was the other thing seriousness or play yeah. and seriousness no I felt I feel I feel like I actually moved the needle for other people because I was totally willing to integrate that into my sales you know mm -hmm. okay so if um if we can talk about like how would you explain we've got I better preface this we've got a huge five-year-old following here right? <laughs> Cult following five year olds always tune in at our podcast. If you can explain oh, your first, is that true? No, yeah. I wish it was. Oh. We probably have no followers. <laughs> like, <laughs> joke, like my grandmother, my grandmother's my, like she's 93. Well, she's... We haven't launched yet, so yeah, let's, let's see. Oh, let's... I'm not worried about it, but y'all will, will keep getting them. How would you explain what you do now to oh. a five year old? Oh. Oh, oh, um, okay. Oh my God. I remember. Okay. I would, um, I create space for people to use all every faculty. No, I wouldn't say faculty. Okay. Hold on. I would say 
I help people imagine and build better worlds. Cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. I love that. Nailed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, there's my slogan. Oh, slogan. So, Sonny, you have had an incredible career. So could you share with our listeners, how did your career evolve over time? So this is, um, I do have a a perspective on this because I, like, I don't know if y'all have ever seen Game Storming, the first book that we wrote. Have it, read it, love it. Oh, cool. So there's this, there's in the opening chapters, we talk about fuzzy goals. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, Dave, t- Dave and I, we, we're, we're actually about to do the second edition. So we're both excited, cool. but it's like, I never, I had intention and aspiration and I had a vision and like, I knew my core values just even deep early. And so, but I never was like, oh, it has to be that. So mm-hmm. I would just sort of respond and adapt. So I would mm-hmm. like sense and respond. Mm-hmm. And I th- and that has been a really weird and surprising experience. And it's it's filled and it goes back to what we were talking about, mistake making and risk taking and like trusting that you can figure something out, like if it, if it doesn't go the way you think it will. And all of those qualities were con- cultivated in early life. Right. So my career was totally unintentional and 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 circumstantial and um um improbable and also uh, it was like a a playground and so you know when people when i and i have friends who want to predict and i uh, understand the instinct what is their next career move and i'm like you just don't know like just keep throwing out your lines and see what comes up and then and then evaluate that according to your core values and trust the process which is so ridiculous to say because it's so fraught with all kinds of confusion and so forth Mm -hmm. but that is that is what I when I in retrospect uh, that is what I've been doing and it's fine you know it's like and it's it's not all successes I have failed and bombed so many times so many times but that's part of what we do Like that is part of what we do because we trust that playing will ultimately be fruitful. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so I would say that that is the guidance I would give to people starting is like have a vision and tension, Mm -hmm. take very good care of your relationships with other people, Mm -hmm. um, get some mentors and don't be afraid to take small risks like micro experiments and get feedback. And I, I guess that's what your soft systems thinking might include too. Iterative, yeah. iterative. It's it's a it's a continuous learning process. Mm-hmm. Essentially, yeah. is what soft systems is is about. Mm-hmm. Um, totally, not necessarily locking into a, um, an answer, or a, you're yeah. not you're not even looking to solve a problem. It's a problematic situation which is ongoing. Uh-huh. It's continuous, so it's you don't so solve a problem and then yeah. it's into a box as if that's solved because mm-hmm. it's know. you're dealing with complex mm-hmm. human so interaction. Hard. I- yeah, it's so cool that you're like Ronan. You seem to get energized by that. Like, I love it. <laughs> yeah, because most people get freaked out by that, and so it's just cool that you are really like vital. It gets you like um vitalized because I think the future is going to be a lot of that. It's just nobody knows. I mean, did y'all hear the UN said it was like global boiling, not global yeah. warming? Global yeah. Bo- yeah, yeah. I have I have been like grieving at night because I'm like, oh my god we don't know what is going to happen and we don't and we just have to be able to adapt and change and like take care of each other Mm -hmm. because we have no idea and i mean and then just throw ai in there you know and it's like um excuse me (laughs) how are we going to do this you know how do you think sb inc fits into this kind of like current work that you're doing or even kind of future view Well, well, th- thanks for asking that. I'm still designing it because it's definitely related to collaborative intelligence. So like, mm-hmm. um, because when I was the innovator, so I was, you know, SB Inc. have been running it for 16 years. I was recruited by the CEO of Mural to be the innovator in residence. And mm-hmm. so I did that for a year. And then when I got out, um, I was like still very much enamored with this reality that collaboration is really hard for people. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a buzzword and I know that it has meaning in all these different areas, 
But for me, I'm I design I'm designing a system around teaching collaborative intelligence. I'm not using that language in the system I'm designing, but um, uh, th I think that's where I can add value yeah. and help and support people because it's just sort of what uh, the skills that I have developed over my whole life and at the sort of richest form, you know. And I think it's probably I think it's going to be crucial. And mm -hmm. I think it's really hard to do um, in a in the ways that I'm thinking of it. You know, like we can definitely create environments where people can sort of do light versions, but I would like to, there to be some kind of trained Jedi's, like people who really do know how to get. You know, are you a Star Wars person too? Right? <laughs> yeah, you have me. A Jedi. <laughs> I use Star Wars of course, for like everything. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> I, I literally call people on my team different characters in Star Wars. It's <laughs> I love it. Uh, your question, you're up. So <laughs> I would love to ask you, Sonny, about the perception of doodling and how has that changed since your TED Talk in 2011? And for any of our listeners that have not heard Sonny's incredible TED Talk, please, oh. please <laughs> get onto YouTube and listen to it. It was absolutely incredible. So how <laughs> has the perception, if it has or not, changed? Yeah. I think there's more freedom in that space. Mm -hmm. It's weird because perception is this thing that like opens and then it can close depending on who and where you are. And so, cause I, I'll say this in a um, roundabout way. So there was like, cause again, AI. So there's this woman, there was like this image that came out on LinkedIn the other day. And it was this woman, somebody had generated a picture of, you know, they put the prompts in somebody generated this picture of this woman and she's holding this uh, white haired kind of zany looking, you know, lady all excited about something. And she has, she's holding up a photo, a, a piece of paper and on it says, I don't have to draw anymore. And I was like, no, you know, <laughs> it's like, like, so it's weird because I really made the case for doodling because it's a universal behavior. It's like, it's timeless we have been using just like play in a way we've been yeah. using it forever mm -hmm. to do all kinds of amazing and valuable things contemplative thinking you know like engagement focus creativity slowing down so it's this gorgeous expression of our humanity and so that i do think that um people's receptivity to that is has changed and also i invited doodlers to come out of the closet and they did you know, they really did. Yeah. I mean, at least in my small world, like I got hundreds of, of fan mail, you know, like people yeah. like, thank you. And so, and I still do. And um, uh, so uh, there's definitely people on earth and educators in particular, uh, I think we're the biggest readers of the doodle revolution. We're educators in all the um, grades. And mm -hmm. so I was very moved by that. And, but then you have this crazy phenomenon where people are like productivity gains with AI. And then they're like, I don't have to draw anymore. I'm like, it's not a have to, mm -hmm. it's an opportunity, you know? So who knows what's going to happen? I have yeah. no idea, but I will be waving a certain flag for sure. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think that goes back to part of our, the depth we think we needed to understand what is play and yeah. why do we play and we transitioned into the inactivist approach around mm -hmm. 4e cognition to understand that what you how you move your body and the tools mm -hmm. that you use create what are described as affordances which then help you think so it's not that you just punch something mm -hmm. into a like a ai and it's going to generate it it's like your cognition is derived from the act of sketching and exactly. building so exactly. your thought process is what you do with your body. Mm -hmm. You can't just. <laughs> There's no disconnect between both. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and that was the if, same with visual language. Like people would always say like, oh, um, in my textbook, like there's infographics. And I'd be like, that's awesome. Super glad for that. Mm -hmm. But when you make them, it's actually better. So yep. if you're learning the subject matter and you create the infographic yourself, yep. Mm -hmm. everything about that is better for all the reasons you're describing yeah. so what what's an affordance like where where uh, it, is it, it, it's often a, just, so it's the gibsons uh amongst other researchers but um it's an opportunity for action yeah you describe as. um and it, it, you know there's a whole depth to this now which i'm not going to well, but it just creates opportunities these yeah. opportunities so tools create opportunities to think it's extended cognition. They extend yeah. your ability to think. 
Like, that's what I said about whiteboards all the time. I was like, because it's driving me nuts. I don't live. So your whiteboard behind you, normally I would have that space in my home. And so we're in between houses and I can feel the difference in my ability to organize, understand, comprehend, because I know what it's like to have that, that extended space. And so, man, it is driving me absolutely batty because I have, I think probably like y'all, I have all these models and visions and yeah. I, yeah. it, it's too much for me to hold in my, yeah. um, in my Ram. And so, uh, oh my God, I can't, just can't wait. I saw y'all's whiteboard. I was like, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> I miss mine so much. It's in all my packed material. Well, let's yeah. get you tactile right now. Let's oh, do it. We're let's gonna, we're gonna let's get, get to playing. the Lego. Okay. Let's get those fingers busy. Look, this is my link. <laughs> this is my, like, my Emerald uh, Empress crown. I love it. <laughs> so I have all my stuff. Should I get cool. it? So do you have... Okay, Sonny. So build number one. What inspires you about your work? What keeps you curious and motivated? And Ronan, I'm probably breaking all the rules. I'm not sure. Like okay. I feel like you break those rules. You break those rules. Okay, because this little dude. So I wonder if this can fit in here. So what inspires me? This is like a, a, a legit metaphor. I don't mm -hmm. know. If yeah. So what inspires me about my work is like I'm just gonna stand this dude up. So <laughs> is the possibility of creating new potentials mm -hmm. cool. that like support this dude and in flying into another space. And this guy, look, he has actual wings. Oh, look yeah. You. Yeah. So um, I know that I, uh, I mean, look, here's another one. So these, I think of like, if I was, if I was thinking about potentiation, I would think of this as like a gear spinning mm -hmm. that makes all these other possibilities lift off. That's part of what inspires me about my work is change. You know? Change. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Helping people get somewhere that they weren't able to get before. And will I hit you with build number two? So, Sonny, build number two is how do you think your work helps people think and feel differently about the world? How do I think... I think that it creates possibilities for them to um, like they read it again. Cause I have a feeling, but I need to, I need to hear How the question. Do you think your work helps people think and feel differently about the world. Oh, I think it gives them hope, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think that the, um, I think that they're, they need to see examples of people that are like, willing to climb a ladder yeah. mm -hmm. and invite them into something something beautiful and possible mm -hmm. is this crown like oh yeah look at so there's like a crowning glory moment when they get to the um a place where they didn't anticipate that they could go and um i think that the uh world looks a little brighter and a little bit more does this crown fit on this dude like oh it's cool this crown do y'all know what it's for for whatever you wanted to do it's for whatever <laughs> you name it <laughs> your metaphor that, that's the best answer ronin <laughs> it's for whatever you want it to be for um you can't see my guy hold on so yeah like i there think that when, i think that when people see the work that we do i just told my nephew yesterday i was like he loves legos and i was like did you know that you can use Legos to like design innovations for telecommunications companies? And they're like, no, oh. <laughs> you know? So I think that it gives people an opportunity to feel that they, to bring out the best in them, you know, those qualities in them that are kind of latent, yeah. but they're, cause they're not necessarily welcome in the places that they occupy. And when you do that, it just feels so good for people to have, that invitation and then they suddenly become um a shinier version of themselves yeah. and they surprise themselves with what they're capable of and that is that's i think a big part of why i do it those Very moments okay know? we're gonna put you under pressure with bill number three what curiosity or conundrum do you want to conceptualize with lego and take your time like we're kind of putting you on the spot here 
What kind of curiosity? Curiosity or conundrum do you want to conceptualize with Lego? Yeah, I already know that how which that um I want to make something that's like separated. Okay, watch. So okay, I'm just gonna do this as a very simple example of what I'm actually trying to tackle with my collaboration system. So how much time time you'll normally give people? Loads. Don't you feel yeah. under pressure? Take your time. Oh, Take, I, uh, keep going. So I'm just going to use this as like a metaphor. Mm. So, and I need like a, uh, some kind of like X, but, um, because the problem that I'm the conundrum to that, that is, I am, I have been obsessing about it for years is, and how to resolve it. Not that it, it, it's not resolvable in an ultimate way, but mm. it is resolvable in these temporary momentary ways it is um, separation. Mm -hmm. so so in my in all of our experiences in the human condition people have this sense that i'm here and you're there and we're not interdependent mm -hmm. um and when you realize that there's a flowing fabric of reality that actually actually intimately connects all of us and what is nourishing for me is also nourishing for you in um not in every single way but mostly then you have this space where there is this emergent possibility of something beautiful. Yeah. And so all the environments that I create and design in my team are intended to soften the separation so that you feel like almost like, and this is where my, my Zen practice is so crucial and important to me is that you've, you were the, the boundaries between you and reality and you and other people and you and what you can imagine are just dissolved mm -hmm. and you are then in an open space of, of possibility. And you can apply that to any problem or challenge you're trying to solve, but you have to get safe and trusted and inspired. And it can't be about, it cannot be an ego enterprise, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, it's just when you do that, it's then you lose each other. And so, and you lose all this possibility. And so where's my other guy? I have this other guy, this other dude I built. Oh, here's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just like it when people are like side by side and they're like, sort of like they're one unit and yeah. they don't have, they're not, the sword isn't there, you know, is this a cookie? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not across. Uh, what's that called? Even uh... like a cookie. Cookie. He's okay. Getting... A cookie. Oh, sorry. Cookie. I thought it was the character. Giving him a cookie. Sorry. <laughs> so he's like, they're sharing. He's giving them a cookie. Oh, there you go. Right. Like you break it in half. And so <clears throat> I'm actually very devoted to designing a system that makes um, more of that possible. And I do, and I do think play does that too. When people yeah, and it's very it. similar with, you know, the work that we do in the workplace around right. cross-functional teams, collaboration, mm. getting people huh. to, to connect as well. That's why I admire the work that y'all do. Cause I know that that is a, a huge gift that you're offering, whether they know it or not, they won't, yeah. they may not know it at the time and, or they may not know it ever, but they'll know it in some way They'll know it, not necessarily here, but unconsciously or physically, they'll know it. And so, and that's a gift. That's a huge gift. Well, it's been a gift chatting with you. Yeah. Like we've come oh, to the end of our conversation. It's I'm disappointed because like, this is wonderful to talk with you. <laughs> I know. I chat. was like, well, if you, I know, but there's, now that we know each other, there's still so many ways to play yeah. because, mm -hmm. yeah. Cause like I have so many things I want to test. Like I'm creating these little playgrounds for people to come and do all this game testing. So maybe y'all should be part of that. Let's do that. I'm gonna think I'm gonna steal y'all. I wanna I wanna start saying <laughs> I'll start saying y'all way more. <laughs> all y'all. If you wanna go <laughs> you wanna really throw down, you say all y'all. <laughs> all y'all. All y'all. What do you say? Made. You don't say you guys. You you say what do we say? Well, I think uh, we say ye a lot, which ye, does not make sense. Thing. Ye, it's not even... we lived in Australia for a very long time. And That's I remember so cool. my students said to me one day, what does ye mean? 
boy <laughs> eating. What is that? <laughs> that does not. It sounds very biblical. Like, yes, yay, yes. Go with <laughs> yeah. How are ye? <laughs> what are ye doing? Um, so yeah, they, that's awesome though. Yeah. Let's I'll trade. It up. We'll take you all, and you can you take. take. <laughs> Sonny, it has been an absolute pleasure and a delight. Honestly, I've enjoyed every moment mm, of talking to you today oh um, i loved how y'all gave me all this fodder for um for conversation i love the work you do i think it's really important Same. and it's and i, I admire you. Back at you <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. that's why i'm like we we support we need to support each other like jedis have to support jedis let's that's go do that it works you know as in our star wars metaphor so <laughs> gotcha <laughs> hey this is the start of something beautiful yes, yes so you're here to yeah. the future yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, Perfect. thank you for having me. And if you want suggestions for other people, I have them. Yeah, thank so, you so much. I just think it matters. Like community of practice really is matters. Yeah, and yeah. So it's like, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you have you made it through half your coffee. That's a it's a today is today is my, my new favorite day. Oh, there you go. <laughs> end on on Winnie the Pooh. That's what a beautiful ending. <laughs> I know. It's, this isn't even my coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much sonny thank you it's been so such much, a pleasure sonny. have a wonderful yes, day same. thank you thank you